So if you're wondering what on earth the Bebop Anacrucis is, <laughs> let me start by saying that Anacrucis is the proper term for what we otherwise would call a pickup in written music. It literally means pushing up in Greek. And the one dictionary defines it as the unaccented note or notes which precede the first accent of any rhythmic division in a composition. So before we can understand how important and unique this is in the context of a bebop line, first let's look at an example of how it is used in the blues. And this is something we've all heard and most likely played. What? Two, three, four, one, two, three. Interestingly enough, the blues anacrusis gradually evolved and gave birth to what some like to call the bebop anacrusis. I'm Richie Zellan, and in today's lesson, I am excited to share a seldom taught melodic and rhythmic device used in literally thousands of lines by the bebop masters. And if you think I'm referring to just some pickup at the beginning of a solo, please stick with me because it goes way, way beyond that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you that it is an essential component of thousands of bebop lines. So to get started, I want to demonstrate the most common example of the bebop anacrusis from a line by guitarist Grant Green. And this is from the pickup measure of his solo on I Concentrate on You. One, two, three. In this initial example, we have all the elements that define a classic bebop anacrusis. And they are, number one, an eighth note triplet usually employing the current chords arpeggio in ascending thirds and occasionally partial arpeggios are also used. Number two, the triplet will commonly start on an upbeat, either beats two or four, and result to the downbeat that follows, that is beats one or three. And as a result, the bebop anacrusis isn't something that occurs only at the beginning of a solo. In fact, it is mainly nested within several measures throughout an entire solo. And note in this example how the triplet arpeggio is literally pushing up and resolving to the downbeat of one, literally fulfilling the Greek meaning of anacrusis. Even though this is the most common use, we will see occasional variations where the triplet occupies a first or third beat and resolves to a second or fourth beat. Number three, the eighth note triplet will usually have an appended eighth note preceding it on the upbeat of the previous beat. And occasionally it can be preceded by two eighth notes. So now that we have defined what the bebop anacrusis is, let's examine some variations by several of the bebop masters so we can better understand the different ways we can incorporate them into our lines. That said, I have put together a 17-page PDF with 57 notated examples, including TAV, for those who want to do a comprehensive study. And since it would take hours to show you all of them, I am going to show you some characteristic examples, and I'll later tell you more about the download. So to continue, since we call this concept the Bebop Anacrusis, it is only natural that we begin with examples of it in the playing of one of bebop's most influential musicians, Charlie Parker. And there are dozens of examples in his solos. So let's look at some of them and then we will see how later musicians were influenced by Bird's use of the bebop anacrusis. And I believe that this alone should serve to establish the importance of this device. So for starters, here is an example from his solo on ornithology. One, two, three, four, one. Note the eighth note triplet this time over the second beat ascending on the F arpeggio 
with an appended eighth note on the upbeat of one. It then resolves to the third beat, which starts a descending line consisting of four eighth notes. And I want you to remember this example because we will see how musicians after Charlie Parker have used it extensively. Here's another example using the same formula, only that it appends two eighth notes on the first beat. This is from his solo on Anthropology. One, two, three, four. Here's another example of the bebop anacrusis featured in several measures of Bird's solo over She Wrote, Take Two. One, two, three, four. One final example from Charlie Parker, even though I could go on and on. This is again from his solo on Anthropology. One, two, three, four. Note that instead of the usual eighth note triplet, this one uses four sixteenth notes on B2. And although it's not the classic bebop anacrusis, we can call it a variation because it fulfills the same function. Nonetheless, the second half of the measure uses the classic triplet on the fourth beat measure with the appended two eighth notes on beat three. So let's see how musicians after Charlie Parker have used the bebop anacrusis. Let's begin by examining a line by Sonny Stitt one of the most influential bebop saxophonists after Bird. And this line is from his solo on By Accident. One, two, three, four, one. Mm. Now, let's compare this to the initial line I demonstrated by Charlie Parker. The notes may be different, but the contour or shape of the line is 100% Charlie Parker. And this is the case with many lines by Sonny Stitt. Listen to these four measures from his solo on Just You, Just Me. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four, one. Now let's take a look at a line by Dizzy Gillespie. And we know they played together, but what we don't know is if Bird influenced Dizzy or vice versa. I haven't had a chance to examine Dizzy Gillespie's recordings before he played with Charlie Parker, but I would be interested to do some research on this. Uh, this is from his solo on Hot House. Again, compare it below to the first line I showed you by Bird. One, two, three, four. And here's a line from another influential bebop saxophonist, Johnny Griffin. And this is from Rhythming, from a section he did as a sideman with Thelonious Monk. One, two, three, four. Again, note the first measure, how it utilizes the same contour as the Charlie Parker line. Then notice how Griffin uses a variation of the bebop anacrusis in the first measure. Are you starting to convince yourself of how important this device is in the context of the bebop idiom? Well, while we're on the subject of saxophonists, let's take a leap forward and see what John Coltrane did with it. And here's a line from his solo on Lazy Bird. One, two, three, four. Again, compare it to the Charlie Parker line below. He uses this identical contour a few measures later in this same solo. The classic bebop anacrusis is used on beat two, a total of four times in this solo alone. And I include all these examples in the PDF download, as well as two examples from 
Coltrane solo on Giant Steps. This again goes to prove that there is no post-bop without a foundation in bebop. All mainstream jazz as we know it today is rooted in bebop. And if you're still not convinced, stick with me because I will prove it to you by the end of this lesson. Next, let's look at an influential bebop trumpet player, Clifford Brown. And this one's from his solo on Get Happy. One, two, three, four. Again, look at the Charlie Parker phrase below it, and we have a very similar contour. Next, let's go back and examine the bebop anacrusis in the playing of two more important saxophonists. Here is a line by Dexter Gordon from Fried Bananas. What? Two, three, four. Again, compare it to the line by Charlie Parker below. And this is no coincidence. You'll find it in solos not only by saxophonists, but by every instrument. So guitarists, don't get restless. I will cover our instrument shortly. But first, we need to get an education from the musicians who established the jazz language. So here is a line by Sonny Rollins from his solo on Dig when he was a sideman with Miles. One, two, three, four, one. Here we see the classic bebop anacrusis in the first half of the initial measure. And on that note, let's examine how some Pianists use this. And here is a line by Bud Powell from his solo on Anthropology. One, two, three, four. Again, it's the same contour as the line below it by Charlie Parker. Let's look at a line by pianist Red Garland from his solo on If I Were a Bell as a Sideman with Miles. One, two, three, four. Again, the same contour as the line below it by Charlie Parker. And it keeps coming up in the playing of later pianists, too. Here's an example from a line by Bill Evans from My Funny Valentine. One, two, three, four, one. Again, it's modeled after the Charlie Parker line below. And while I'm covering Bill Evans, I briefly want to comment that there is another variation of the bebop anacrusis that I found that Bill uses a lot, or used a lot. <laughs> and it consists simply of using a descending eighth note triplet instead of the customary ascending arpeggio. And here's an example from his solo on Autumn Leaves. One, two, three, four, one. If you compare the contour to the uh, Charlie Parker example below, you'll notice that it is the same basic formula, only that the initial two eighth notes and the eighth note triplet arpeggio on B2 are all descending. And to demonstrate an example by a great present day pianist, here's one by Keith Jarrett from his solo on Falling in Love with Love. One, two, three, four. Next, I am going to show you some examples by influential jazz guitarists. But before I do, I want to tell you about the study I prepared for download. It features a 17-page PDF with a total of 57 notated examples, including tab. Also included are all the transcribed examples from this lesson, plus many, many more. And this is the most in-depth compilation of the bebop anacrusis and its variations you will find. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it might be the first and only one. So if you are serious about mastering the bebop idiom, make sure this concept is integrated into your improvisational vocabulary. To make it easier to practice, I am also including a MIDI file which you can open up in the free downloadable app MuseScore. 
And this way you can open up the file and view the notation as well as transpose it to any key, loop any section and play it back at any desired tempo. And this will allow you to practice efficiently and play along with any desired example until you can hear it in your head and play it anywhere you desire. All of this can be downloaded for a nominal contribution from jazzguitar.richiezellen.com forward slash premium and you'll find it under the mini courses section. So let's look at three examples by jazz guitarists. I showed you one by Grant Green at the very beginning and here's one by Wes Montgomery from his solo on Bud's Bow Arts. One, two, three, four. Note how he used the bebop anacrusis over three measures in a row. On the first one, he uses it over beat four, and he does so again in the second measure. Only that this second time, he uses the descending arpeggio variation like I previously showed you in the second Bill Evans example. Finally, on measure three, he uses it on beat two. Next, let's look at an example by George Benson from his solo on Basie's Bag. One, two, three, four, one. And you can see again how it compares to the classic Charlie Parker contour in the example below. And next, let's look at an example by an even more contemporary jazz guitarist. This one's by Mike Stern from his solo on Sunny Moon for Two. One, two, three, four, one. There it is again. Eighth note, rest, appended eighth note on the upbeat of one, ascending triplet arpeggio over the second beat, and four eighth notes to complete the measure. For those of you still with me, <laughs> I could go on and on, but I think I've given you substantial proof that the bebop anacrusis and its variations are an important element of the jazz language. By the way, for those of you trying to tame the six-string beast, in the PDF download I included several examples by other guitarists, including Barney Kessel, Jimmy Rainey, Tall Farlow, Kenny Burrell, Joe Pass, Pat Martino, and Jim Hall, as well as other saxophonists, pianists, and many more. Also, I want to encourage you to take the initiative to seek out other examples on your own. There are so, so many other important jazz musicians that I couldn't cover in this lesson. And that is simply because it would take up volumes, not to mention an incredible amount of time to transcribe. So I truly hope this lesson was helpful and you will be able to incorporate this concept into your solos. As usual, I appreciate your comments, likes, and welcome any questions you may have. And if this is your first time on this channel and you enjoyed this lesson, Please be sure to subscribe and click on the bell icon so you will be notified of my upcoming lessons. Until we meet again, don't forget to practice, 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 and then practice some more. And remember, if you want to make it to Carnegie Call, well, call an Uber. <laughs> Peace be with you. <laughs>